It is a pleasure to introduce Ruth Johnson, who has been chairperson of the Friends of Glasgow Necropolis since 2012. The Friends of Glasgow Necropolis was formed in 2005 and was set up by a group of extremely dedicated people with a variety of backgrounds and interests in order to raise awareness and funds for restoration and conservation of the cemetery. There are now 10 tour guides who pre-COVID undertook three general tours per month, as well as bespoke and private tours for individuals, schools and organisations. Ruth has instigated many of the projects which she will talk about today. She has also compiled information and photographed many of the monuments, as well as producing a book called Afterlives and a pocket guide that makes visiting and navigating the necropolis just that little bit easier. Uh, my name is Ruth Johnston. I'm the chairperson of the Friends of Glasgow Necropolis. This talk is going to cover a bit of history about the background why the necropolis is here, the work of the Friends of Glasgow Necropolis, and of course, the women of GRI. First of all, then the brief history. The two most important things to mention are the Merchant's House of Glasgow and Glasgow's dramatic population explosion. The Merchant's House, an important organization in Glasgow, was established in 1605. They purchased the highest hill in Glasgow in 1650, and it remained an informal park for nearly 200 years. This image shows so the fir park, as they called it because it was covered in fir trees, behind the cathedral. The population growth of Glasgow during those 200 years are as follows. In the 1650s, 12,000 people, 1750s, 36,000 people, and 1850s, 360,000 people. And this is a view of Glasgow in 1650 from fir park uh, and the population of 12,000 people. And this map shows um, the connection up of uh, Glasgow's little fishing village on the banks of the Clyde, connecting up through High Street, up through Castle Street, to the ecclesiastical buildings beside the cathedral and opposite Fir Park. Population, 36,000 people. And we're on to 1825, the Merchant's Park, uh, which they tried to change the name from Fir Park to Merchant's Park in 1825. It didn't really stick. It had been known as Fir Park for so long that it never changed. And this is a view because of the Industrial Revolution in Glasgow, the fir trees had begun to die and they decided to make it a more formal park, replanted it with deciduous trees of all different kinds. They put John Knox Monument on top of the hill. Now that was at one stage that was proposed it was going to be William Wallace, but it ended up as John Knox. And the population now in Glasgow is rising to 360,000 people. And we're running out of burial spaces. The only burial spaces we had were Glasgow Cathedral, old and new graveyards, both to the north and the south, and the Ramshorn Kirk, uh, which is in the Merchant City. This building was one that was built in 1824 to replace the, an older building. And it's when Ingram Street was formed and that covered the front part of the graveyard there. The other graveyards were Blackfriars um, College Churchyard, where all the professors from the college, i.e. the university, were buried. And they now have a monument in Glasgow Necropolis. And St Andrews by the Green, that's a very small graveyard. Um, all of these were pretty full. Anderson and Carlton were actually out with the Glasgow city centre at that point. And we weren't alone in running out of burial spaces. This is a lovely image of London Churchyard where they built up the ground round about the church. And you, I can't really imagine what it must have been like living uh, adjacent to this churchyard. Uh, Glasgow Necropolis is contemporary with Kensal Green in London and uh, Glasnevin in Dublin and St James's in Liverpool. So there were various other things happening all over this, the, the country. And also in Europe as well. This is Paris from Père Lachaise. Père Lachaise opened in 1804. And you can see that actually Père Lachaise is quite some considerable distance from the centre of Paris. John Strang, um, he came from a family of wine merchants, as a member of the merchant's house, and he'd seen Père Lachaise, and he brought back what we probably called a, a feasibility study for a proposal for a garden cemetery in Glasgow. And unlike Père Lachaise, our hill uh, was just across from the cathedral and in the, the centre of Glasgow. 
He took this proposal to Jane Ewing, Lord Dean of Guild of the Merchant's House at this particular stage, and he proposed the proposal was discussed with local landowners, and um, that would be Deniston of Golf Hill and Mackenzie of Craig Park. They were all to the east of the site. And this is actually James Ewing's home, and which is the site, became the site of Queen Street Station. Now his memorial is beside the John Knox monument. As you can see, it's quite a plain looking monument in the upper photograph. But if you look at the lower one, you can see that in the past it's had quite amazing bronze decoration, which we've read about saying it was, it was taken into safekeeping. Nobody knows where that safekeeping is, unfortunately. So the Merchant's House approached David Hamilton, who's known as the father of Glasgow's architecture. And they had, had asked him to form a, an architectural competition, along with Stuart Murray, creator of the Botanic Gardens, James Cleland, and super, superintendent of the public works. And he actually managed to get, gain some work from uh, this particular uh, cemetery. Designed by David and James Hamilton. James was his son, so the practice, the Hamilton practice consisted of David and James Hamilton. Another work by the Hamilton practice in the Glasgow Necropolis are the main gates, which we'll see later in the presentation, the superintendent's house and office, and the Egyptian box. Apart from Hamilton's work there, uh, two of his apprentices, J.T. Rockhead and Charles Wilson, has work in the Necropolis and other works. And these are some of the Glasgow's most famous architects, and it's a real um, a display of some of the most amazing uh, architecture and sculpture of all forms, really. Um, Alexander Greek Thompson, C.H. Wilson, James Smith, John Baird, Hunnaman Kepi, and Charles Rennie Mackintosh. And this view of the necropolis is from round about 1866. This was the height of the popularity, if you'd like to call it that, of the necropolis. Uh, after that, there were many other options for burying the dead. And, and the reason why it's such an amazing array of wonderful architecture is all designs had to be approved by the Merchant's House. This image shows you in July 1878, the visitor's book showed that 13,733 people visited the necropolis, 12,400 from Glasgow, and 1,333 other visitors. It was an incredibly popular place to go around. Although you had to be admitted by the superintendent and properly dressed. We've got to the way it stands now in 2021. The necropolis was given by the Merchant's House to the Glasgow Corporation, now the City of Glasgow, by the Merchant's House in the 1960s with a sum of £50,000 to cover bequests for the upkeep of family monuments or mausoleum. It's a grade A listed site, both memorials and the landscape. There are three and a half thousand memorials, having lost some 100 stones over the period. 50,000 people are buried here, with a quarter of those in common ground. That means unmarked graves. Burials which took place in common ground do not have a memorial stone. These burials ceased in 1875, and since then all burial plots had to be purchased. So whether a memorial stone was placed on them was up to the family. I'm now going to speak about the Friends of Glasgow Necropolis were established in 2005 and run by a dedicated team of unpaid volunteers to raise awareness and funds for restoration and conservation work within the Glasgow Necropolis. We provide guided tours and presentations and we do grant application to raise funds. Up until COVID, throughout the year we ran three tours a month free to the general public with donations requested. We now have 10 guides. We have successfully had funding from Heritage Lottery Fund, Historic Scotland, which is now Historic Environment Scotland, and from many small trusts. Over this period of time, we've raised around 100,000 uh, for various projects in the Glasgow Necropolis. Contribute the book and guide sales contribute to our funds, and the new edition published in 2020 celebrated our 15th anniversary and with updated text and photographs of all the restoration work. We'll start with the conservation and restoration work from 2005 to the present day. We'll start with the Glasgow Necropolis entrance gates. Uh, they were designed by David Hamilton in 1838. Uh, now this was some years after it actually officially opened in 1833. Uh, they opened it commercially for burials before all the other elements like the gates, some walls and various other um, buildings that were required for a cemetery were put together. Uh, they were made by the Eddington's Phoenix Foundry, and this is one of 
three Glasgow foundries that we have examples of uh, uh, cast iron work in the necropolis. And it was restored in 2012, thanks to a donation by a member of the Eddington family, who's also a member of the Friends of Glasgow Necropolis. You can see that the, on the left-hand side, the image of the logo of the merchant's house, and that's a clipper, which is a ship on top of the world. Uh, you went through the gates and you crossed the Bridge of Sighs as a processional way. And this is just to show the Bridge of Sighs as it was uh, in these days, where you could actually walk through the small archway on the left. Now, that was also wide enough for carriages and just a small pedestrian access through the small arch on the right hand side. And the Mullen Diner Burn ran below the Bridge of Sighs. It no longer does, as you can see, and the photograph of how it is now. The Mullen Diner Burn now runs underneath Wishart Street, uh, nine feet below in a tunnel. And that's just a photograph to show um, the image, the change between the two. Uh, this change in landscape really affects some of the monuments and some of the landscape that we'll come across later in the presentation. Once you cross the Bridge of Sighs, going from the land to the dead, you come across the facade. This was designed by architect John Bryce. Now, he only came second in the architectural competition. His brother, David Bryce, came first. But as he actually did, the David Bryce worked mainly in Edinburgh and John Bryce worked mainly in Glasgow, John Bryce got most of the work. Uh, people in Edinburgh didn't seem to think that Glasgow had the taste or fancy to be able to produce anything of worth when the proposal for the necropolis was put forward. I think we kind of proved them wrong there. Uh, this was restored in 2019 was, uh, by the city. You can see the image at the bottom left is how it was proposed to be with cast iron gates um, and the path run round the back of the facade. Uh, the image at the bottom right shows how it was before the restoration work with infills of uh, concrete and lots of the finials and urns and all the decorative work and the balustrading was all missing. So that's all been restored to a wonderful effect. The Jewish enclosure. Uh, this was in 1832, again designed by architect John Bryce. And this was the first part of the Glasgow Necropolis to open for burials one year before the necropolis officially opened in 1833, as I mentioned. Uh, this was due to the outbreak of cholera in 1832. Further outbreaks of cholera in 1849 and 1853 killed thousands of people. Fresh water from Loch Catron came into the city in 1860, and the outbreak in 1866 killed 68 people. Again, you can see the image on the left-hand side, how this would have appeared in the first place uh, with the entrance. And as I mentioned, the fact that the Wishart Street um, instead of Mullen Diner Burn, the description of the walls of the Jewish enclosure was that the, the water of the Mullen Diner Burn lapped at the bottom of the wall. Well, obviously, when it came to the restoration work, we didn't really get down to restoring it to its full depth of the wall. And obviously, the entrance as well is very much smaller. But there's huge amounts of work being done with the Jewish community. And there's a plaque there now which shows the 56 people that are buried in the Jewish enclosure. And uh, there's a seat there and, and a lot of extra work on the, the periphery um, round about the monument's been done. Uh, this is William Miller, laureate of the Nazi. I've included him because it's a poem that everybody seems to know. When you take people on tours, um, even from around the world, people seem to know the wee Willy Winky. Miller is buried in a family grave in Toe Cross Cemetery where the headstone is missing. And this is a memorial erected by the city by public subscription. Similarly, other monuments are here by public subscription to people who would not have been able to afford a monument here. Phase one of the restoration of most of the large mausolea. And we're going to, this is a funding uh, from some from ourselves, Glasgow City Council, and the funding obtained from Historic Scotland, which is now Historic Environment Scotland. The Black Mausoleum was the first mausoleum built, uh, erected in 1837. Uh, Robert Black and the death of his daughter Catherine, who died at the age of 12, and five of his children died under the age of 21. The burial registers up to 1850, so between 1833 and um, 1850s, 
uh, it would tell you the cause of death in the burial registers. That changed after the 1850s and it became the address of where the people stayed. And this is an image of it before the restoration. Uh, the, moment, the, the lintel was broken over the doorway, removal of the, the roots that were actually destroying the roof. And this is the newly carved stone lintel and in place, uh, along with all the other work that had to be done to this, this mausoleum with the restoration of the cast iron gates. The next one up on the row, this is a path that has most of the very large mausolea on the left is King Mausoleum, the next one's Buchanan and the next one's Hutchison. And this is the King Mausoleum restored again with all the restoration work done uh, with the gates. And this is the interior of the King Mausoleum. Uh, as you can see, it's large slabs of stone, incredibly heavy with two iron rings and take four men to carry that. And this was some way of preventing body snatching, even within the large mausolea where you would felt that would be protected. There was still some issues given with uh, body snatching these days. Uh, the restoration work done for the interior of all the mausolea uh, came, the stone came from historic Scotland at that point in time. And any work that needed to be done on the roof, it was case nest stone that was used for, the, for those slabs. And that's it completely restored. And you see, they may have to have to move some of the, the slabs around to accommodate that. The next one up on the left is the Buchanan Mausoleum. This is to Margaret Jane and Elizabeth Buchanan. They were three daughters of George Buchanan, whose business was in cotton, i.e. the slave trade. And uh, they were, he, actually, George Buchanan had one son who died unmarried with no children. And the three sisters also died unmarried with no children as well. Um, they, they were originally from Woodlands in Glasgow, uh, and th that was in the countryside. But when the city started to encroach on the area, they decided to move to Kilmarnock. These are two of the sisters. The third portrait, unfortunately, is missing. These are portraits by John Graham Gilbert, uh, one of Glasgow's most famous portrait painters, and he's also in the Glasgow Necropolis. Uh, there's a full history and information on the profile pages on these people and on our website. The restoration work on this mausoleum, we raised £25,000 from our tours for the restoration work on here. As you can see, this is where some of early uh, so-called restoration work had been done, where concrete had been used to infill any gaps. There was a layer of paint on the stonework which needed to be removed. And this part of the balustrading had, was missing, that had to be recarved. So it's huge amounts of work. They found a really good match for the stone, which is another difficulty you have with a lot of the quarries now being missing and no longer in existence. And this is the final restored um, mausoleum with the gate designed. We have an archivist on our committee who designed this gate. The next one up on the left is actually the Hutchison, but that came under phase two. So we'll come back to the Hutchison on this path. And the next one then is the Angus Turner Mausoleum, which as you can see, it was in a pretty awful state. Uh, they had a new roof to put in and the parapet had to be newly carved as that's missing as well. And this is it finally restored and the cast iron work restored as well. Now we'll come back to the, the Angus Turner a little later in the thing. If you can just look at the parapet and see there's two sections on the right and the left hand side on the corners. Uh, and the final one on, up this path is the Egyptian vaults. Um, and this, uh, there's a lot of things you will hear if you come on, on our, our tours uh, to do with the architecture inspired by all sorts of architecture um, from Rome to Egypt, et cetera. And there's an awful lot of symbolism in the necropolis, as you can see from this, where you have the hourglass with wings, which is time flying away. And you have upside down torches and upside down wreaths. Uh, and that is referring to the fact that you are under the ground. The lit torches mean that life is still there. It's a belief in the resurrection, so life is still existing. The gates are by Eddington's Phoenix Foundry yet again, and uh, the design was by David Hamilton. We had to, obviously, with the missing part of the gate, had to be recast. And it's called the vault, so as you can see now, once they uncovered all the grass at the top of the vaulted ceiling, and this is it fully restored with the gates. And the gate restoration was funded by the gift aid on the main gates we saw earlier. Phase two is the Hutchison and the Delta Mausoleum. 
um, this image shows the Hutchison open to the elements. And you can see the gates are in a terrible state. Um, the very unusual design on these particular dates was a Moorish symbol, symbolism in the middle with very Victorian ornate stuff around about. And this is it shown in the state it was another image of that. And it's completely restored there with the roof back intact with a lot of support systems in place, the lintels being supported and a huge amount of work on this. And this final one in phase two was a Delta mausoleum. And you can see the panel on the left and um, that needs to be replaced. The stonework needed to be done and uh, balustrading on the top section as well. Uh, this shows the interior of the Delta. Uh, I showed the slabs in the interior of the King. Now quite often under the stone slab, they would also have a cross gridded cast iron, again, that would take four people to lift as well. Again, further protection against body snatchers. And the image on the left uh, shows an empty panel, which would have had all the details of the family, which I don't know when it went missing. Um, we have bound the details now. It's always been called Delta Mausoleum because it's in the Delta section of the necropolis. And nobody knew who it belonged to, but our wonderful archivist and researcher Morag Fife has found out who it's to, who the various owners were over a period of time. And if you look at our, we have a newsletter called Grave Matters, and they're available on our website. And there's a section on that that explains all the history of the Delta Mausoleum. And that's it, finally restored. Again, our archivist, um, uh, Roger Guthrie, designed the gates for this. And you can see the panel on the left with the upside down torch now matches the panel on the right. It kind of done what mausoleum was restored by the city. And this is the only image of any of the monuments or mausolea in the necropolis that would found to be found in the Mitchell Library. And what a wonderful dome it is there. It's now fully restored. There was an awful lot of work needed to be done in the interior of this mausoleum as there'd been concrete put in the roof, which put a hell of a strain on the roof system. Um, the angel's head was missing and it's now restored. Holdsworth mausoleum and the Ray Wilson mausoleum. The Ray Wilson's on the left and the Holdsworth's on the right. And this is an image, a photograph by in the 1970s by Swedish photographer Dag Nielsen. Um, we look into trying to get as many photographs and images we can of all the uh, monuments and headstones that we can to try and identify any missing elements, decorations, little bits of architectural detail that may be missing. So when we do restoration work, we can actually restore them. This image showed the glass that was in the upper lantern of the Holdsworth. And uh, some of the conservation students um, actually discovered a very strange sliding mechanism for the doorway for the, for the Holdsworth. It's hope, faith and charity that are the figures in there. And you can see on the rest of the restored um, images here um, that there, that's the picture down at the bottom, which shows the figures inside. If it had a sliding mechanism, you would not have been able to see when the doors were closed, you wouldn't have been able to see the internal image. Um, sculpture but I don't know why that was done with the sliding mechanism a bit of a mystery anyway beautifully restored now and we're on to the Monteith mausoleum which is our current um, ongoing project to raise funds for the restoration work donations from our tours go to this restricted fund we've raised 60,000 from donations for our tours powerpoint presentations grant applications crowdfunding and a legacy and this is and one, the mausoleum to Major Archibald Douglas Monteith, which was um, created in 1842 by architect David Cousin, Cousin and Gale. A monument, obviously, that you can see has been uh, with the stone, the quality of the stone hasn't been good enough to withstand the acid rain and the industrialization of the city. And even those images you can see on the left are now crumbled to sand. It's a very soft sandstone. However, the same architect um, used the same design for the porch on a building in Edinburgh. And um, this was originally a church, St Thomas's, at the bottom of Lothian Road. It's now a nightclub called the Gilly Doom. Uh, and this was designed by the same architect a year later, 1843. 
and we have all the detail that we need uh, to see how the, the, um, the, these faces looked very strange little faces. And I'm including the Lieutenant Joseph Gomazinski Memorial for a very specific reason, which I'll come to at the end. Um, died in exile in Greenock in 1840, uh, 1845 and restored by donation by the Polish consulate, £10,000. This uh, crest was only in existence for some 20 years in Poland. And we came across two Polish students from Nicholas Copernicus University in Poland. Uh, who were determined that this, this monument should be restored. And that's it finally restored. There was an opening ceremony, a celebration of it being of this restoration work. And that meeting of those two women who were involved in the restoration work, it led me to the idea of actually a photographic and stone conditioned survey uh, to record everything within the Glasgow Necropolis in case any of, uh, uh, oh dear. The meeting of these two women led on to a very good relationship, uh, which has taken us forward with a photographic and stone condition survey of all the monuments and headstones within the Glasgow necropolis. This would record everything, so if anything went missing in future, we would have a record of it, of all the three and a half thousand monuments and mausolea. It was started by myself and a student from Texas, Ashley Jemison. It started in 2012, funded by Erasmus and a partnership between Nicholas Copernicus University in Tehran and Page Park Architects in Glasgow. Students came for a period of three months, photographing, surveying and transcribing the inscriptions. Later, some surveys of the larger mausoleum were done by Historic Environment Scotland and Conservation Architecture students of the University of Strathclyde. Eventually, once it's all in place, the data will be available on a searchable website to aid research and help families find their family memorials. People have been involved to date. Uh, as you can see, there are 13 people here, 12 from Poland. Uh, so you started off with Monica and came for the three months in 2012, and she did uh, the compartment minima. And there were 91 monuments in Minima, and she went on to start during her period of time. She managed to start on to Beta as well, and that carried on. The 13th member, Michelle Craig, um, we couldn't get funding um, and people to come uh, during 2018 and 19, and I managed to get some funding from the Scottish Graduate School of Arts and Humanities, and Michelle did secure this of the 67 monuments there. These are the following sections still to be surveyed. Uh, it's two thirds complete. Uh, however, with the Erasmus scheme no longer being available, we're investigating alternatives. And this is the map of the compartments and the work that's been done to date. Uh, so the compartments in the necropolis are named for the Greek alphabet, which shows certain evolution of the necropolis, which started off with 24 acres and is now 37. Pink areas illustrate the areas being surveyed, but still to be updated, as I mentioned, Michelle did Secundus, which is down in the bottom right hand corner. I also mentioned previously that we're trying to find as many photographs and images we can, and this is from the Washington Wilson collection, I've taken a photograph on the right hand side to try and emulate what was uh, the same kind of angle, um, not quite managed to achieve that, but close. Uh, and you can see the wonderful figure on the left hand side, the winged figure is missing altogether, just part from his foot is left on top of this monument to, to a sculptor himself. Uh, that was Peter Lawrence. But these photographs help with, as I say, finding little bits of architectural detail which are probably missing. The second one from the Washington Wilson collection shows that when it was handed over to the city, they decided to remove all the garden enclosures, as we called them, um, and some of the paths, as you can see in this particular case, to allow for ease of mowing the grass. Again, it shows quite a lot of details that are actually now missing, in this, missing from some of the monuments. Another one from the Washington Wilson collection, and this is the one that shows um, the Ag Angus Turner um, mausoleum just to the left of and down from the John Knox monument. You can see the Angus Turner and you can see now that there are finials on the corners of each corner of the Angus 
Turner mausoleum, which we didn't know about at that particular stage. Otherwise, we could have probably restored them. The next project to talk about is the First World War Roll of Honour. This is featured on our website. Uh, it was, this project was funded by Heritage Lottery Funding. Uh, there's a printed map and it's got the grave locations marked on the map as information on all the people that we found. Some funding involved finding unmarked graves, so we did some archaeology with some of the schools, local schools. Uh, some workshops with them. The results were inconclusive, unfortunately, and more work needs to be done on this aspect. Everyone in the necropolis appears on the burial registers, including those in various areas of unmarked graves. And we do a Remembrance Days tour, if anybody's interested. So in 2018, a new sign appeared in the necropolis, which just said Commonwealth Graves, and I didn't know what that meant. Um, our genealogy researcher, Morag Fife, took up the challenge and with the record she has, we now have 156 men and one woman commemorated mainly on their family stones. Eliza Margaret Nisbet, the woman was found by chance by one of our committees of care. Another member of the research team, Gavin Simpson had experience with regimental history and undertook to contact all the schools, universities, regimental museums that had some connection with our men. Huge task. And now with nearly all the full histories, along with the photographs available on our website, still further research is going on. Another project uh, that's currently ongoing, instigated by our archivist and researcher Morag Fife. The volunteers are helped to buy Morag from our home in Leeds. The volunteers are mainly from our membership, from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Family History Society, and people who've come on our tours. Our database now stands at 37,688 out of the 50,000 people that are buried there. And that's from to, to the end of March, 2021. But more volunteers are welcome to help us with this task. Morag also produces the regular newspaper, Grave Matters, which I mentioned earlier. And that's from interesting finds. There are some very interesting little stories. Uh, and the, uh, this also helps families find the memorials we have inquiries from all around the world and donations from this source also help with our restoration and conservation work. And finally, um, coming to the women, of course, and a few men of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. The Friends of Glasgow Necropolis feel we owe such gratitude to the NHS, especially during COVID, that as a tribute, we've got together funding to restore the three monuments commemorating GRI hospital staff. The research on this is thanks to Morag Fife and Diana Burns. As you're probably aware, Glasgow's Royal Infirmary opened in 1794, funded by wealthy patrons. The infirmary's purpose was to treat Glasgow's growing population and at the same time, train generations of doctors and nurses. The first nurses to work at the Royal were little more than domestics, um, but the work of Florence Nightingale and her volunteers during the Crimean War did much for the status of the profession. The first nursery stone is in compartment Eta, and I've marked this on this map. This was probably erected by the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, but a search of the Board of Management minutes has failed to reveal any reference to the purchase of the there. And this is the stone. Uh, if you look at the names down here, the second last one is to Agnes Whiteman, who is, is non-typical really, as the other five share several features in common. They were all in their 20s, all came from outside the Glasgow area and all died from conditions to which they were exposed during their work. It's likely that the Glasgow Royal Infirmary took responsibility for the funerals and the burials of nurses and staff who died in service and whose relatives, whether too poor or living too far away, were un unable to make the arrangements. The second and third nurse's stone is in compartment sextus, and there are two sides of that. This is very close to the Royal Infirmary itself. This is the first stone in compartment sextus. Three burials had taken place in the layer since 1895. Isabella Sutherland, Mary Shaw and Ellen Little. But the stone itself wasn't erected until 1906, and that's when Isabella McDermott died. Nurse Bella, as you can see inscribed on the stone, was interred in 1906 for 37 years, a faithful and devoted nurse in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. 
the second stone in Sextus. Uh, six nurses buried between 1907 and 1937, four were retired, two died young, and there's still space in this layer, and we don't know why the burial stopped at this date. We're hoping that access to the, the Royal Infirmary's archives eventually will give us some more information on a lot of these women. And that's the names of the six women there. The third name, Margaret Maguire, uh, who's a sister, um, and this is uh, an obituary in the Journal of Nursing. She came to Glasgow from Ireland when she was 18 years old and trained at GRI, where she remained as a nursing sister for 47 years. And she was especially happy to look after children, and she was called Auntie. Our archivist, Morag Fife, has put together information on these 16 women named across the three stones and has treated them as a group, as there's insufficient information on many of them. We don't know what any of the women looked like. Four of the women turned out to be invisible in the censuses, and death certificates were pretty uninformative. Because of lack of census data, there's only first place information for 12. 16 nurses, 14 were single, and two married, Isabella Sutherland and Ellen Little. And you can see the very last one, Isabella Sutherland, was actually born at sea. We're still looking into that one. And on to the patients of GRI that are embedded in the Glasgow necropolis. Found so far, 73 patients, 48 males and 23 females. Um, and between 1851 and 1860, mainly after 1854. 70 embedded in common ground. 50% in Eta, which is the section where the first nurse's stone is, which is far into the area beside the quarry. We don't know whereabouts in the different compartments the common graves are. As I mentioned previously, the archaeology was a little uh, less than clear. Uh, no addresses, no causes of death from 1855. Again, as I mentioned earlier, as after that date, the cause of death was not recorded on the burial registers. We would have to purchase the death certificates. So at present, not able to say terribly much about the patients that are in the Glasgow metropolis. And we do have, have to say something about a few of the men of GRI. There are many medical men buried there. However, so far, we haven't investigated the careers of most of them in detail. But we do have a profile for um, Joseph Coates, who became the first professor of pathology at the University of Glasgow in 1893. We did include Moses Johnson and James Byrne Russell. And the reason for that is um, he's the third superintendent of the GRI during those dates, but he strongly supported the initiatives to improve the training of nurses. Equally with James Byrne Russell, um, he's considered to be one of the top pioneers in public health, and he reformed the way infectious disease was managed and prevented, as well as increasing nurses training. And that's particularly important in this particular COVID era. So that's the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, the Friends of Glasgow and Necropolis established the organisation in 2005. And um, we would encourage you to join the, the work and help the Friends of Glasgow and Necropolis and become a member. We provide monthly and bespoke guided tours, give lectures and presentations from many organisations, including schools, developing our website to become a major education resource and help with inquiries from all over the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>